All right, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is uh, day 35, Church in the Time of Quarantine. It's also April 20th. Uh, historically on this day in 1836, the territory of Wisconsin came into being. So uh, hooray for us on Wisconsin. And in 1916, the uh, first baseball game was played at Wrigley Field, even though it was not called Wrigley Field at the time. But yeah, you know what I mean. So go Cubs. Or I guess no one's going anywhere at this point in time. But uh, anyway, uh, hopefully baseball will be back soon. And uh, we can return to normalcy. So um, today is going to be slightly different. Uh, I've recorded an interview uh, with Father Pei, so uh, this should just lead into that, hopefully. And uh, it was about 40 minutes. I'm going to break it up into a couple of segments, uh, but it's uh, a lot of fun. We're talking about preaching and how uh, how all that works. So if you've ever wondered uh, how you're supposed to put a sermon together, um, I think you'll uh, you'll enjoy. Well, it's always fun to listen to Father Pay. He even pulls out books and stuff, so uh, it uh, it'll it'll be good. And you get to hear get to hear him again after uh, after all his uh, his treatments. So we'll just uh, real quick do our trivia. Uh, yesterday's trivia was what is the um, least densely populated country in the world? The most densely was Monaco. The least densely also starts with M O N, but it's Mongolia. Mongolia is the least densely populated country in the world. Had a few guesses. Uh, one was Greenland, which is not very densely populated, but it's not technically a country. Uh, part of Denmark. Um, so today, as you probably know, um, the religious denomination that has had the most presidents is the Episcopal Church, followed by the Presbyterians. But uh, depending on how you count it, there have been upwards of 13 Episcopal presidents. I don't know if you count Thomas Jefferson in there, you get down, if you jump him, it's 12. But anyway. Uh, so the question is, who are the two most recent Episcopal presidents? Uh, so if you want to send that in, uh, that would be great. Uh, the, they were in the, uh, they've both been in my lifetime, if that's, uh, if that helps as a hint. Um, so if you get one, you, you may be okay too. Okay, well, let's end with a, a prayer today for those that we love, and then hopefully this will transition right into, um, into fun time with, with Father Pei. So... Let us pray. Almighty God, we entrust all who are dear to us to thy never-failing care and love for this life and the life to come. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, the inaugural sessions of, uh, I don't know what I'm going to call this. I'm thinking Saint John, the St. John Chrysostom sessions or something like that. But uh, we'll see how long they go on for if they even need a name. But uh, the idea being we'll uh, do some interviews, kind of break things uh, up a little so you don't just have to look at me. Um, every day and uh, get tired of what I'm saying. So uh, the other thing, um, a friend of mine who works in cybersecurity has told me that Zoom, which we're recording this on, uh, is stored on uh, unsecured Chinese servers so the Chinese government can look at it at any time. So in that case, uh, Xi Jinping looks like Winnie the Pooh. Okay, so we got that out of the way. Um, so our... Uh, our topic uh, for today, we have uh, Stephen Pei with us, and uh, we're going to be talking about homiletics and homiletics, preaching, whatever you want to call it. The, um, the reason uh, I chose this topic, um, not just that Steve Pei is my good friend, but also uh, when I was in seminary, I had uh, two classes that were entitled homiletics, um, but uh, we never actually did uh, any homiletics. The only thing I remember from those was uh, how our instructor's mother made salads, and uh, that traumatized our instructor a tremendous amount because he talked about it um, a lot, enough that I remember how his mother makes salads. So uh, the hope is to get a little knowledge on um, what, uh, what preaching is, what good preaching is, uh, how it's taught, and all those sorts of things. So with that, I know most of you know uh, Father Pei, but uh, let him kind of give you a little of his background, and then... Uh, Kind of like a, uh, a 1950s game show, I sent him the questions in advance, and uh, we'll go through a series of those. And um, yeah, so anyway, welcome, Father Pei, and great to have you with us. Thank you. Um, again, I, I hope my voice is clear. I'm still recovering. Um, so, and if I periodically have to take a little water, there's a reason for it. Um, just my background. Um, when I was in the monastery, uh, my <laughs> superior decided since I had background in uh, debate and theater that I was going to teach homiletics. Uh, the problem was 
there was no Roman Catholic homiletic program anywhere in the world for an, an academic doctorate. And that's still the case. You can't get a PhD in Roman Catholic homiletic. Uh, so, and while I was admitted to the program at Princeton, uh, because it was too Protestant, uh, the local bishop told the abbot no. <laughs> so I um, ended up cobbling together a uh, background that would help me do this. So I started um, I did a master's in uh, classical rhetoric with an emphasis in argumentation theory at the University of Pittsburgh. And then I went on to get my PhD at St. Louis University in historical theology and wrote my dissertation on, um, on the history of preaching. Now, if I would ever published that dissertation, which I regret that I didn't, I think I would have titled it, Why Catholics Can't Preach. Um, because what I did was I looked at how, especially in the American scene, uh, understanding of the preaching task had shifted uh, in a discrete period of time. So technically speaking, uh, I do homiletics, but technically speaking, I'm a historian of preaching, uh, which is not a bad thing, but um, it, 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 it's kind of fun. But as a result of my training, I tend to approach preaching, have approached preaching in a more classical rhetorical orientation. And of course, it used to be the whole discipline at one time was called sacred rhetoric. And so I still think of it in those terms. So that's my background. I taught homiletics at uh, St. Vincent Seminary in La Trobe, and I taught homiletics, not you. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. Yes, you I should have said gone. that it wasn't you. That... Yeah, you were gone by the time I got there. Um, and uh, so I taught homiletics at Neshoda House as well. And I've done a number of workshops uh, and, uh, and uh, clergy uh, retreats and days uh, on preaching. So it, it's, and it's, it's something that I do with great love. One of the reasons I, when I had this most recent bout of cancer, um, when I talked about surgery and that I'd lose a good chunk of my tongue, I said, uh, I think not. Uh, you lose your superpower. I, well, yeah, I, I'm not ready to stop talking. Okay, and, um, <laughs> so there it is. So that's how I come to this, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Well, thank you, and thank you so much for for taking the time to uh, to do this and and be the guinea pig. Oh, so. happy to do it. <laughs> well, something you kind of touched on, which the first question I have, you know, is. Um, you know, when you think of preaching, is there a difference uh, between a good sermon and a good speech, you know, a TED talk or whatever, you know, it is we want to say these days, you know, besides the subject matter, obviously, but structurally and, and all that, is, is there a difference in, in making a good speech and making a good sermon? Um, to be very honest, no. Um, the elements of, of human communication are the same. It's how do we turn those elements to a sacred purpose? So I would say no. Um, you, you use those techniques um, to, to do that which gives glory to God and edifies God's people. Well, that, um, that actually kind of leads into the second question because you, uh, the Tertullian had the famous question of what hath Athens to do with Jerusalem? And the idea of being, you know, can we, can we take resources, um, you know, that are not strictly Christian, um, you know, that are outside of the faith, um, and bring them into, uh, into something uh, that uh, is glorifying to God? That's been a perennial bugbear. Um, 
and and it goes all the way back to Augustine. And this is a copy of Augustine's on Christian teaching. The entire third book of this is on a Christian rhetoric. And basically what he's talking about there is how do we adapt that which is there to the to the task? Almost every one of the great thinkers was trained in rhetoric in the early church. Um, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazianzen, Basil, they all were trained as rhetoricians. They also railed against secular rhetoric, okay? But yet, when they put together their various sermons, they always used the techniques. Augustine, who taught rhetoric in Rome and in Milan, ends up and says, look, and he basically, the way I would translate it, he basically says, why should the devil get all the good speaking? You know, these people come in with the secular stuff and they titillate and they get everybody all, you know, all there. And he said, and we come with this wonderful message of life and we put them to sleep. And so he talks about how we can do that, which is why when I was teaching homiletics, my students had to read Augustine, the third book, and they had to read the rhetoric of Aristotle. Because in my opinion, this is still the single best text on human communication that's ever been written. And he gets it. He gets it. And so it's, it's kind of fascinating. And you can still constantly mine fascinating stuff from it. So, no, there's not a problem to use these things. I think we have to constantly be finding out um, what's there and find the best way to communicate the gospel. I mean, come on, let's face it. Christians have been baptizing stuff for years. I mean, look at the Christmas tree. I mean, we're, we, we pick stuff up and say, woo, that'll work. And, you know, and the next thing you know, we give it meaning that it never had before. The Easter bunny was in the Gospels. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. <laughs> but um, I think it's, I think, I think there's not a problem with, um, with utilizing things that are outside as long as we understand that they're not to take center stage. I think that becomes the point. Um, that's where we have to remember what McLuhan talked about, about the medium becoming the message. We don't want the medium to become the message. We want the message to be, to be effectively communicated by the medium that we choose to use. Mm -hmm. That's the distinction. You're doing a really good job of, of transitioning into my next questions too. So you, oh. you, you get a, you, you get an extra star for that. But ah. so that, that leads you know to the question of um, you know you could have a brilliant rhetorician or you know a, a brilliantly constructed sermon. But mm -hmm. I'm wondering, audience and knowing the audience, how much um, you know that to kind of you know the I don't know if this is the, the example or something of you have a, a very mediocre preacher who knows and loves his people. And you have a brilliant rhetorician and preacher who doesn't know and love his people. Um, mm -hmm. Which would be the better sermon? Um, the one that loves his people. Um, Aristotle said that there are two major categories of proof when we go to work on making an argument. He says rhetoric is the task of discovering all the available means of persuasion. And she says one of the ways we do that, we have inartistic proofs and we have artistic proofs. Artistic proofs are the things that we can come up with that make our 
you know, invent, what we would call invention that would enable us to make the argument. Inartistic proofs are just the things that are natural, that are there. And one of those, and one of the most powerful ones, is what he called ethos. Okay, the ethos of the speaker. Now, later on, I'm going to get up and move, and I'll be right back. Okay. I'm going to go over here and pull something off the shelf. <laughs> I'll, I'll sing and keep people entertained. Well. <laughs> I'm just over here. Okay. Uh, my first interview, and I've already run you off. So. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is Quintilian. Quintilian wrote... Um, a series of books on rhetoric, which is how Augustine was trained. Okay, so Quintilian took Aristotle and developed this particular system. Aristotle talks about inartistic proof, the ethos. Quintilian put it this way that it's a good man speaking well. That's the strongest proof. Mm -hmm. And it's true. You know, somebody who knows their people, cares for their people, loves their people, and comes bringing the best message they can given their ability will be effective. I mean, I've heard some horrid, horrid sermons over the years um, when I visited and so forth. But the people, you know, the person who cares for his folk, visits the sick, is there when they need him, loves them, that they're successful. Now, does that mean that you get to slack off and don't do your best job? No. You should always be trying to improve. Um, but but the truth is, the ethos of the speaker is absolutely important. And coming to know your hearers is, is also important. Now, I'm going to reference something that uh, some research that's been done. Uh, she's a Danish Lutheran bishop and a homiletician. Her name is Marianne. Garden, G A A R D E N. And she's written this wonderful book called The Third Room of Preaching. The Third Room of Preaching. And what she does is that she makes the argument that when we preach, there is a multi dimensional relationship or space, which she calls the third room. And this is what she says. She said, this research first challenges the assumption that listeners simply absorb what the preacher says in a one-to-one -one intellectual way. This perspective is too limited a way of interpreting what happens in listeners when they receive the sermon. From perspective of the pew, the preaching event is not primarily a question of the listeners transferring the preacher's understanding to their own understanding. Rather, what happens when listeners hear the sermon is that they create meaning. Or, to use a theological word, the sermon becomes an incarnation of meaning in which both the preacher and congregation are stakeholders. The encounter between the preacher's own words and the listener's inner experience brings about what I call a third room, in which the listeners, in internal dialogue, create a surplus of meaning that was previously not present in either the preacher's intent or the listener's frame of reference. Now, to me, that's brilliant. It's also nothing new. Yeah. I think it explains why sometimes after services, people will come up to me and tell me they like my sermon and tell me something about it that I had no idea was actually there. 
precisely. And that's the point. Because all of a sudden, what's happening is you're surfacing things that were there that connect. It's never a one on one to one transference. That's what Aristotle talks about, that's what Augustine talks about, that's what Quintilian talks about. It's human communication. It's, it's back to that model. Remember the model of human communication about A, you know, sender, receiver, you know, noise, all that stuff in between. And we have to realize that listeners always bring something into the mix. Mm -hmm. So that if the message is coming to them, it's going to come through filters. And we have to be prepared to deal with those filters. No, I think that's often, uh, the, there's weeks where I think I've written the greatest sermon in the world and no one cares. And then there's weeks where I show up and think I've written, you know, I did my job and wrote a sermon, but that's about all I really did. And people mm -hmm. tell me they loved it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the other thing, pardon me for being too religious, but the other thing is, you know, the Holy Spirit is engaged yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, there, there's always that, uh, but I think there, some, some people go into a little too much of, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Like you, you do need to prepare too. But, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, well, talk, kind of following up with that question. So how much of being a good preacher uh, is, is God given talent and how much um, can be taught? Well, I think it can be taught. You know, it, it's taught more easily if somebody can actually do something. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're a good speaker naturally, um, just to use you as an example, um, and you have this uncanny ability to find all kinds of stuff in popular culture that you make connections, you know? And which crack, I mean, I used to sit, uh, I used to love it when you preach at, at daily mass at the house. And I would just sit there and chuckle because I'd see what you were up to. And I would be laughing inside. I couldn't let it go before because you were building it up. So I could see exactly where you were going with it. And you'd make these connections. And it's just like, oh my heavens. And you sucker punch. <laughs> the congregation like time after time after time and we always fell for it <laughs> you have a natural ability to do that but you've also honed it as a craft and that makes a difference mm -hmm. so can it be taught absolutely in your case thank god you were willing to do it self-taught <laughs> 